Uh, we we want to welcome today to the Grange, uh, number 196 uh, in Easton, uh, a uh, the Langwater farmer, Kevin O'Dwyer. We are so pleased to have him here to address our membership, and we look forward to hearing his presentation, how we got started, uh, what he has to offer, and what the future holds for Easton and Langwater Farm. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Benny. It's nice to be here today. Uh -huh. Break from the cold outside. Um, yeah, I was just here today to share our story of how we founded Langwater Farm, along with my wife Kate, my sister Rory, and my mother, and tell a little bit about what we're doing today and our plans going forward here for the farm. Okay. Well, we appreciate so much. So, so let's get started. We're all anxious and interested to hear what you have to say and the slides that you're going to show us. So. Great. Thanks again for coming and being our guest at the Grange. The Grange meets third Monday of every month at 7 p.m. at the Oaks Ames Memorial Hall, and we welcome the public to attend our very interesting meetings. Uh, the March meeting will host Harry Lynn, who's a member of the Eastern Garden Club, and is in charge of all of beautifying all the public places uh, in the town of Easton, and he will be showing us and uh, telling us about. Uh, what the club has done over the years, what they are doing now, and projections for the future. Uh, anybody who has some interesting ideas for Harry and the club, please come with those ideas and share them. We look forward to seeing you third Monday of every month, 7 p.m., Oak Ames Memorial Hall in Northeastern. Thank you. Okay, well this is the uh, slideshow that we put together to tell the story of how we started the farm and to show a little bit about what's going on there these days. Uh, so to begin, I start with this overhead that was taken a year or two before we arrived on the land. So here, this picture is showing the Main Street field, the Post Office field, and the Washington Street field. And it's at this time only being used for hay production. Um, the land did have a very rich history in agriculture. Up until the 1960s, it was it had built a reputation for being a famous Guernsey breeding farm. I have a picture of this fellow here was a pretty special bull. His name was the Imperial King of the May, and he had some very prized genetics. Uh, the farm operated up until the 60s, and then after that, that operation was disbanded, and for the last uh, 50 years or so, it has sat idle, uh, being hayed annually by the Marshall family or the McNamaras. Uh, so we first arrived in 2009. Um, my wife, my sister, and I, and my mother started the operation uh, we entered into a lease agreement with the Ames Realty Trust back in 2009. I just cycle through. There's a couple more slides. That shows the barn that had burned down a couple of years prior to our arrival. That's located right off Main Street. No, no, that's the Langwater barn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that photo is from the 1930s, you said. From yeah, a while back. And then this one as well. Um, this one was given to us by Paul Berry. Um, and apparently the Ames had hired a aerial comp a company that took aerial photography at that time, one of the first around, to take these aerial shots. So this one is taken, the, the photographer is probably above the town offices here, and he's pointing east. Um, you're seeing what is now the location of our farm stand <laughs> and our barn at the north edge of the farm, the northeast edge of the farm. So originally there was a homestead there right where the entrance to the farm is now. But you can see some row crop there. Uh, there's an apple orchard to the north of the house and even across the street. Uh, you can see there's a lot of agriculture going on in the area. And to the south there's some garden plots as well. Uh, here's an old farmer baling some hay. He's got an old tricycle 140 farm all tractor. And then there's us. This is the same field where you just saw that farmer. There's my wife and our friend Michelle planting garlic in the fall of 2009. This was the first crop we got in the ground. We hired another farmer from Stoughton, Charlie McNamara, to till the ground for us that year because we didn't have any equipment. 
and then we did all the planting by hand into that hard rocky soil. After we planted the garlic we built our first greenhouse. This is probably December of 2009. We built that greenhouse. We had our first encounter with some of the rocky soils here in Northeastern, uh, but that didn't slow us down. And now we get into this following spring of 2010 where we started the first seedlings, uh, which proved to be a kind of a difficult task. When we arrived at the land, it was just raw land. There was no water and no electricity. So we built our tunnel and we had to bring water up to this greenhouse every day to water these seedlings. And we started these seedlings in, I think this was the middle of March, and so you still had some fairly cold nights. So to help with those cold nights, we used row cover over the seedlings, and then we played human thermostat, which was when we would go up on, on particularly cold nights, nights where it was forecasted to be in the mid-30s or in it in danger of freezing, we would go up there and run a generator and a small propane heater to keep the temperatures up in the 40s and just sit out there in the truck all night and uh, monitor the greenhouse temperature. Uh, those were some harder times. That spring, later that spring, we planted some peach trees. This is a shot of the excavator repairing some of the holes for putting those peach trees in. And then we opened up under some four, four pop-up tents for our retail business and our CSA distribution. This was in early June of 2010. So we operated under these four tents until we could afford to build a farm stand later that summer. We had blown through all of our startup capital on a tractor and the greenhouse and other startup costs, fertilizer and seed that year. So we had to wait until August until we had a little more money in our pockets to dump back into the business and then we purchased some lumber, some native lumber, and built this wood framed farm stand that still stands today. Here are some pictures of us under construction that summer, late that summer. Uh, we were kind of cutting our teeth there as far as being carpenters as well as farmers. It took us a little while to build, but by the Labor Day weekend, I think, of that year, we opened up the farm stand with some pumpkins out front and some mums. There's a shot, an aerial shot at the end of our first season there. So as you can see, we're using a couple acre plot in the Washington Street field, an acre plot in the post office field, and just one acre in the northeast corner of the Main Street field. So we started pretty small. That winter was a busy winter for us. We had Madison uh, our first child. We also built three more greenhouses, two more in the post office field and a heated one down by the farm stand to get our transplants going in the spring, the following spring, so that we no longer needed to play human thermostat. This one was automated and the heat would fire up on its own. Later that summer we had our first farm to table dinner that we hosted in the Main Street field and this was a great success uh, we sold out the tickets right away. Mostly CSA members attended. That was a fun night. Later that year, we started construction on our barn. Uh, so this is the beginning. This is us breaking ground for our barn that we built behind the farm stand. We, to save on costs, we harvested all the lumber from the property, all of the red pine that we built. The barn with was harvested just north of the post office and we milled it all on site. A friend of ours had a mill on a trailer and he brought it to us and we milled all of the boards right there on site. And this was the construction here. We did all of the building ourselves with the exception of hiring this crane to help us set the trusses, which was a big job. And here's a picture of some of the siding going on. Now that's amazing uh, that you did all that carpentry yourself. Now. Did you do that uh, with con uh, instruction books, or had you did, had you had ex prior experience? Uh, nothing like this, nothing major like this kind of building. But um, you know, after doing a lot of research and having a little background using building the farm stand and a couple other small projects, we felt confident enough. And you know, the uh, this style building, a pole barn, isn't too complicated construction. We were able to get our heads around it pretty easily. We're just, you know, we're putting posts every 10 feet, 
and then connecting them with uh, lateral braces. So it, uh, it there was a learning curve there. It probably took us a little longer than it would have taken a professional, but uh, that's how we have to do it when you're starting a farm. So. Mm -hmm. And it was fun. It's a fun project. Part of the fun of being a farmer is being able to do mm -hmm. a bunch of different things and not doing just one one trade or or one uh, type of work every day. You get to do a little bit of everything. So we added on to this barn over the past few years. There's a cupola going on top of the barn that allowed us to get some better ventilation in there so we could dry our onion and garlic crop. And then this past spring we expanded off the north side. We added a loading dock and an overhang with a more covered space. There's the framing of the overhang. And under the overhang, half of the overhang we built a cooler so that we had additional cold storage. And there's a shot of us putting the cooler panels together. So this provided us with much needed cold storage so that we could continue so we could continue to expand production and store more vegetables through the winter. Here's a shot of our our propagation house where we produce all of the transplants for the field. Uh, this one is the heated greenhouse that has all the automation. And there's the newest addition to our family. That's Rachel, who we had in the fall of 2013. Well, you make beautiful babies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And there's <laughs> Madison. Madison just turned four. So she's there standing proudly in front of some greens, probably munching on some of them. And my wife, Kate, standing in front of our greenhouse tomatoes which are uh, one of our favorite crops, tomatoes in general, but uh, these greenhouse ones are pretty special. they really vigorous plants that grow, as you can see there, close to 10 feet tall. Do you plant any tomatoes uh, outside? We do, yep, we do. Well, last year I think we put in about an acre of field tomatoes. We'll expand on that a little bit this year, uh, but that that's our, our biggest crop, not necessarily the most acreage planted, but... Um, our highest grossing crop and our favorite, my favorite, to eat and to produce. We put a lot into our tomato crop from starting the seeds until harvest and packing them. But a uh, real point of uh, emphasis for us. So I've included some shots here of strawberry production there. There's some nice plants. Somebody harvesting strawberries and Madison and I out scouting the fields one evening. And there's Miles O'Brien staking tomatoes. He's one of uh, Miles was one of our first crew members that came to us back in 2010. He still comes back every summer. He just went away to college this year, but he uh, hopefully will be back again to take care of our tomato crop. He's pretty much uh, the primary uh, worker out in the tomato field all summer long, staking and weaving the tomatoes. He takes a lot of uh, pride in the tomatoes we love to see. And there's Liz harvesting radishes. I think this was probably last spring, spring of 2014. And those are some uh, brassica and other greens there. I think you're looking at turnips right in front of us. And to the left we have tatsoi and arugula. That's a similar shot, actually a similar angle to that one of the first photos I showed you of that, the old barn that had burned down. That's kind of the same vantage point looking east, or sorry, looking west. You can see a lot has changed. And there's Rachel on a uh, early spring day harvesting lettuce from underneath the cover. You know, the, uh, in the rocky soil, the cover is hard to take on and off. We use soil on the edges to hold it down, so... If we can avoid taking it off the harvest, we do. So mm -hmm. as much as we can, we try to sneak under there and gather what we need without taking off the covers. And we do it rain or shine. There's a couple of guys working in a downpour, bunching some early turnips. And this is one of our uh, original tractors. This is an old farm all that we use for cultivating. Uh, you can see this is kind of a special rig. It has a high clearance. The axles are high off the ground so that they don't damage the crop. And it also has an offset engine so that the operator can look directly below him at the crop that he's cultivating instead of having to look over the hood. It's uh, a little more accurate that way. This uh, 
looks like carrots, small carrots that are being basket weeded there. And there is our one of our first peach crops. Uh, the first, those trees were planted back in 2010, and they didn't fruit until 2013. Um, but now we're enjoying some nice peach crops in the late summer. And then some sunflowers. We like to plant uh, sunflowers around the perimeter of the farm so that everybody can enjoy them as they drive by. Uh, we plant more than we need intentionally just so that we can always have a good supply of them, but they also make a really nice cover crop. Um, when they're flowering like this, they attract a lot of native pollinators, which are, is good to have around the farm. And then when we mow them down and incorporate them into the soil, they provide a lot of organic matter, as well as being really vigorous and out-competing a lot of the weeds. So you get the added benefit of a little bit of weed control while they're in the ground. There's an up-close of one of my favorite crops. Those are Brussels sprouts growing on the plant, little miniature cabbages. And those are some nicely weeded leeks. Uh, that's a shot of me packing broccoli on a fall morning and there's Patrick harvesting sweet potatoes uh, you can see the tool in the back is digging them that blue tool in the back of the tractor I have a better shot of it coming up uh, there's one of our first pumpkin harvests this is probably an October day and there's a big haul of winter squash loaded on the trailer acorn squash kabochas butternuts there's the potato digger on the tractor heading out to harvest some potatoes. And that's it in action right there. How does that work, Kevin? So the uh, tool is engaged in the ground and it undercuts the hill that the potatoes are grown in. And it has a conveyor that moves the soil, all the whole hill, the soil, the plant, the potato, up the conveyor. And as it moves up, it's shaking it and it shakes all the dirt and the debris out, separating them from the potatoes that all falls through the grates on it and then the potatoes roll off the back and lay on top of the soil and then we follow along with crates and grade them as we pick them up so this is a a great tool that's allowed us to really expand production uh, mechanizing what was once a very labor-intensive job now we're able to plant much more acreage yeah. of potatoes and sweet potatoes now how do you find production of potatoes when we have such rocky soil? Uh, difficult. <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the harvesting of them by hand was even more difficult. Um, he, we were used to what we called it groveling for potatoes before that, but uh, you'd end up with a lot of dirt and rock under your fingernails, and it was kind of a painful job and uh, certainly time-consuming. Uh, this machine has taken a lot of that unpleasantness out of the job and sped it up so infinitely. so the machine um, can actually be attached to the tractor yes and so the tractor can have multiple machinery with different tasks uh, supporting different tasks attached to it right sure yep yeah so this one is just attached to the three-point hitch on the back yep um, but this actually the next slide shows a different implement on the back of that same tractor this is another favorite tool of ours, another great labor saver. This is the water wheel transplanter. And there you see Angelina and Rachel planting Napa cabbage, I believe that is. Mm -hmm. So those green wheels that you see that are riding over the bed are punching a hole in the plastic every foot. Uh, that spacing is easily changed by moving the spikes around. But the spike punches a hole and it delivers a shot of water into that hole. It just leaves you with a nice muddy solution in which to set the transplant. And then the two riders on the back have pl uh, trays of plants in front of them, and they're able to grab a plant out of that tray and jam it in the hole as the tractor and unit move down the row. So before, we used to walk along and have one person drop the plants, and then someone else or a couple people following behind, crawling around on their hands and knees, planting the plants and there was no water involved so the quality of transplant was le was not as good and it was much rougher on the poor folks doing the planting now we can plant uh, a lot faster and do it a lot more comfortably and produce a much higher quality transplant so then uh, subsequent to that you, you come along and water it right 
Uh, well, after after that initial uh, the plant is set, it has the that unit provides enough water for the plant's water requirements for the first couple of weeks, even if it doesn't get enough rain. But underneath that plastic is some drip tape, which will provide the additional water requirements later in the season as those requirements become greater. The bigger the plant, the greater the requirements. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So here is a shot of us drying onions. Um, originally, we were drying all of our onions in the greenhouse. Uh, you know, after the transplants came out of the greenhouse, we would repurpose it as an onion drying facility, which was not ideal because we would have issues with sun scald. Uh, since building the barn, we're now able to dry the onions in the barn with the cupola of venting it nicely. Here you see stacks of onions. This is this year's onion harvest, which was over 15,000 pounds that we stacked up in the barn and dried for two or three months in there until the temperatures started to get near freezing, at which point they were packed up after being dried. This is a shot, this shot you've seen, this is the original shot of the land when we got here. And I added this again just to juxtapose it with what the land looked like in the spring of 2014. There's an aerial shot that was just taken. I think that's probably late May of 2014. But you can see now the land is back in use, all of the prime land being taken advantage of here. It's, this one is looking west at the post office field and at the main street field. Just another angle of the same field there. Now, where are the peach trees? They're Let's there, see. aren't they? Somewhere? The peach trees are back here. They're um, they are over in the main street field there on that grassy area. It's surrounded by bare ground that's all been tilled, and they have that one uh, shagbark hickory tree just to the right of them. <coughs> and here's an aerial shot of what the farm stand area looks like now. It's even come a little ways since this picture was taken. That project on the barn, the loading dock, has been completed. Uh, we've put in some additional driveways uh, to access the barn area. Now, did you take that aerial shot? No, this was actually taken by uh, one of our employees, Linda Reinhardt's father. He went up uh, in May last spring and took these shots for us, which is really nice of him. Hopefully we can... Uh, encourage him to do it again for us and mm -hmm. keep tracking our progress, which is pretty cool to see. Yep. And so this is a shot over here of the tractor went over to the Wheaton Farm. This past year we entered into a, a lease agreement with the town to use some of the acreage at the Wheaton Farm on Bay Road. So this is a picture of us breaking ground last March, rolling it over with a moldboard plow. And there's a picture of the Wheaton Barn and some of the land around it has been rolled over. And uh, actually it's interesting that you mentioned potatoes, Penny, because this year our plan is to move all of our potato production over to Wheaton to take advantage of the much less rocky soil there is over on the south side of Easton. When we were tilling the ground over there earlier last March, uh, there was we needed a uh, we needed a rock to hammer something with, and I couldn't even find a rock. I spent 15 <laughs> minutes looking around, searching for a rock over there. Couldn't even find one, which was, a, I guess, is a good thing. Yeah. This is a cool picture given to us by our friend Dan Argenbo. This was the last time the Wheaton Fields were in production, uh, and Dan tells us that this is Sam Wright chopping corn in the fall of the late 70s. I think he said it was 1978 or close to that, but uh, there's Sam Wright chopping corn, and Dan tells us this was the last time that that land was in agricultural production until just this past year. And there's us putting the first plants in the ground at Wheaton. There's Erica and Zoe transplanting on the back of the transplanter. They're putting Brussels sprouts in the ground. So, anyway, that's a little bit about what's going on today, and I was also going to talk about our uh, our marketing strategies we are try try to keep our marketing strategies pretty diverse um, with a few main ones our our retail farm stand obviously is a big part of what we do there's our stand in the spring we do some plant sales um, mostly vegetable transplants uh, we're trying to provide varieties that we know grow well and are well adapted to this area and also eat very good 
to our customers, which I think is unlike a lot of the other uh, larger nurseries, box stores in the area, which are not necessarily growing varieties that are well suited to this area. Uh, the farm stand is open early May until Christmas, and there's a shot of the interior, a panoramic of the displays. There you see some cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, peppers, and carrots, eggplant, and beets. This probably was taken in early August. This one is a little bit later in the fall. We've got Brussels sprouts on the stock there with broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage around it. And you can see the pumpkins are out, so it must be getting close to October here. Some more of that brassica mix. And the pumpkin stack, the pumpkin totem poles. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, and then we do Christmas trees in, Mar in uh, December as well. We always like that shot of the trees illuminated with the snow on them. That's pretty. That was a bumper day for sales there, with the cars lined up. Another important part of our marketing is the farmer's markets. Uh, this is a picture of Kate set up down at the Pawtucket Winter Farmer's Market. So we have do about five or six markets, uh, one of them down there in Rhode Island and a couple in Boston. And we also participate in the Easton Market and in the Crescent Ridge Market over in Sharon, as well as one in Attleboro. Uh, it's nice to get out to other communities, increase our exposure in other areas. This is a shot of Erica and Sean setting up. I think this one is in Brookline. That's in Brookline, a big tomato display out front, one of our feature crops. Uh, another aspect of our business is, that's growing is the wholesale business. So right now we're mostly di marketing directly to restaurants a couple of small distributors. Uh, it's nice to have your stuff in the best restaurants in Boston and Providence and get your names on those menus. I think that's really great exposure, really great way to market the farm without having to spend any money. So do they put on the menus um, Langwater Farm tomatoes? They do, yep. Um, some restaurants will, will name specifically where each of the vegetables came from. Some will just put on the menu towards the end that they source products from our farm. Um, but it's it's cool to be in touch with all these chefs. You know, these guys are equally excited about the food that we grow as we are. Um, you know, and oftentimes they'll send us back pictures of what they've done with the the produce. And so this is a picture that a chef at the Ashmont Grill sent us. He's using our lettuce there. He pickled our radishes and our red onions, and he paired those with our cucumbers and some cherry tomatoes in this salad. So it's nice to uh, to be in contact with the chefs and to be sharing the food with them, and then they can share back what they've done with it. Do they also share your address so that people know where to find you? Uh, they don't, but uh, hopefully... It's no. something to negotiate. Yeah, maybe we can get, their, get our address or our website on their menu. Yeah, sure. right. Yeah, that would be nice, website. Um. This is a shot here of our hay wagon full of folks who have just had a tour of the farm. Uh, this is another aspect of the business that we've been trying to grow, the agritourism or agritainment part. Uh, so this involves hay rides and pick-your-own crops. And we also host birthday parties and school groups for some educational hay rides. And uh, we've got to thank the folks at Parkview and Morrill Hall for being some of our original supporters here and bringing classes down. Uh, th those partnerships have worked out well. Uh, that's a picture of me giving a hayride at the farm to table dinner back in 2011. Uh, hopefully we'll do some more of these farm to table dinners. We've, uh, we did a couple this past year with the farmer's daughter and those worked out well. We did actually did a couple of them in her restaurant. Uh, this year we hope to do a couple at the farm as well as a couple down in her restaurant. Here's a shot of the pick your own pumpkin field and the hayride out to that. And there's Rachel's first birthday this past year. We had it at the farm. What a darling. <laughs> <laughs> She's a sweetie. Oh, and there's a shot of the farm to table dinner that we did. 
think this one was in September. Uh, we we hosted the meal in Condra's restaurant, uh, but it included a hayride down to the farm and around the fields. So uh, we are in the planning stages of some more for this season, but they've been a lot of fun and uh, been pretty popular. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about our growing philosophies. Uh, we're a certified organic farm, uh, instituting as many sustainable practices as we can. Uh, one of the most important ones is cover cropping for soil building and providing nutrition for our cash crops. This is a shot of some sorghum sedan grass that's just been planted. Uh, this one will build soil organic matter once it grows large and is turned in. There's a good example of some cover crops being mowed down. This is a mix of rye and vetch. Uh, the vetch is a legume that will fix nitrogen, draw nitrogen out of the air, and input it into the soil. So we grow the vetch until it flowers, and then we mow it down. And as you can see, the part on the left-hand side has just been mowed. Uh, but all that biomass is being put back into the soil, which is great for increasing the organic matter and uh, the microbial activity in the soil and the vetch is adding some nitrogen. This is a cover crop of peas and oats. This is doing the same thing, not adding quite the same biomass, but the peas are also fixing nitrogen for a subsequent cash crop. And then we also do some composting. So we are taking leaves from landscapers, well just one landscaper at this time, and we're mixing it with all of our vegetable waste and producing a nice compost that's adding organic matter and a little bit of nutrition to our soil. So this is a winter application of compost. Uh, we like to do it in the winter when we can because the soil is frozen and it can support the heavy weight of the tractor and the fully loaded manure spreader without adding any additional compaction to the soil. Frozen ground is like driving on concrete. <laughs> Here's a picture of the farm crew because these guys are... Uh, are as important as any part, any tool that we have or any of the infrastructure we have. This is a great group of guys that we have. Uh, in, the, in the height of the season, we're employing just over 30 employees. Uh, it goes down to seven through the winter. But this is a great group. Everybody uh, is pretty excited. There's Linda with a big pile of Swiss chard. This is one of our favorite photos. Looks like she's got 40 bunches in her arms there. That's quite a load. And there's Miles on the right and Michael Gray on the left. These guys have just been harvesting some onions. And they look pretty happy to be there. And this is another group. These guys are yucking it up on the back of the transplanter. There's Rachel and Angelina and Liz. They're putting in onions, onion sets in the spring. And there's Madison with a carrot bigger than her arm. <laughs> it's uh, one of her favorite crops there. She's always asking for carrots. We always like that photo. And there's some of the fellows there. There's Justin and Miles and Max and Alex. And these guys are uh, fresh off a long day of harvesting onions. Some more of the guys there out hoeing the fields, keeping the weeds back, which is a major job on the farm, especially doing it organically. There's no magic bullets. It's just about good uh, crop rotation and some uh, some backbreaking weed pulling. There's some more of the ladies on the back of the transplanter, and Justin in the squash field. Looks like he's getting a good harvest of summer squash. Uh, there's some of our tomato trophies, which we've been pretty proud of. Uh, the Ma Massachusetts hosts an annual tomato contest in City Hall Plaza, and we've been entering for the past few years and. Had some pretty good success uh, this year. We uh, we took first place in a couple of the categories, including the red slicing and the heirloom. Uh, oh, there's a picture of us at the uh, at the award ceremony. There, Maddie was pretty psyched to have that trophy, as we all were. Tomatoes are a real feature crop for us. Like I said earlier, um, you know they're in high demand. Most of our customers are looking for tomatoes when they come to the farm stand August through October. So we always want to make sure we have a big display of those guys. 
And those are some prize-winning striped Germans. That's one of my favorite varieties. This is an heirloom variety uh, that ripens to that rainbow-colored orange, yellow, and red. It's a beautiful tomato, a nice big one. It's good for slicing on sandwiches. It's a, it's a thick, meaty one. I mean, this is often the feature of our dinner table in the summer. What do you call that? Striped German. Striped German. It's really a beautiful one. Mm. There's one, a couple of cherry tomato varieties there. Sun Gold, which is our favorite. That's the orange one. And I see that pink one in there called Sun Peach. Those are nice ones. Rachel's a big fan of the tomatoes, too. <laughs> She's helping me grade through some of them. And there's uh, one of our halls of peaches this year. Our own peaches, which uh, we love to make a display right by the entrance. Just, uh, the fragrance alone draws customers in. Mm -hmm. And there's some strawberries. This is a crop that's uh, proved difficult to grow organically, but we're determined to master it. Um, we hope to have, we had some nice looking plants that we mulched in the fall. We hope for good things in the spring. Uh, there's some watermelon. That's uh, one of our favorite varieties called Blacktail Mountain, an heirloom watermelon. And a nice haul of some summer crops there, peppers and pickling cucumbers. So part of uh, what we're trying to build our reputation on is quality first. Um, and we think the best way to market our stuff is to just have the best stuff have really high quality f fruit and vegetables and let the flavor and the, the aesthetic speak for themselves. Um, so well, part of that is a lot goes into the growing, taking care of all the nutritional requirements, building a healthy soil, and then a lot goes into the harvest and the post-harvest handling, uh, making sure that we're keeping the produce at the proper temps and the proper humidity levels as as we store it before it gets to market. And then turning it fast, you know, making sure that we sell it quickly. And if it uh, is less than perfect, then we're pulling it off the displays and donating it. There's a lot to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're a scientist as well as a farmer. Yeah, well, a few different things go into it, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, it's been fun for us to to become a part of the Easton community. Um, the, the town and the surrounding towns have been really receptive to what we've been trying to do, uh, which is uh, encouraging. Um, you know, that's inspiration for us to do more, to grow it bigger and better. So it's been a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. we've been really pleased to be here in Easton. Well, we're so happy that you're here. I mean, because you offer something very special and, and unique uh, that we're not going to find at the supermarket. Tell us a little bit about your um, experience at the University of Mass in Amherst. Uh, so, yeah, I went to school out in, at UMass. I graduated in 2004. Um, uh, that was, uh, that's a great community out there. And, uh, you know, as we've talked, uh, one of the nicest places in the state. If I, if I, we hadn't moved back home, if Kate and I hadn't moved back home, I'm sure we'd be living out in Amherst or in Hadley, that area, and farming out that way. But, uh, yeah, we, uh, we learned a lot out there. It's a great farming community. Uh, being around some of the bigger growers in that area was, um, was good for us to be, to be a part of and to learn from those guys. Now, you also studied agriculture, didn't you, at the University of Mass? Well, I, I studied agriculture, and I got a degree in communications because when I was just 18 years old, I was uh, uh, unable to make a, a good decision about what to do. I was, you know, getting advice from a lot of people. Some of them were saying, you know, you'll never make a living in farming. Are you sure you want to continue on this trend, on this path? And uh, uh, so... I didn't get a degree in plant and soils, although I did study it uh, at quite extensively at UMass, uh, but ended up with a degree in communications. And then after yeah. a couple of years out of college, uh, I realized that you know this it wasn't my calling. It wasn't something I could be passionate about, and I got back into agriculture. I moved back home, and I uh, took a manager's job at the farm that I had grown up working on and uh, worked there for five or six years managing until we decided to move on and do our own thing mm -hmm. about five or six years ago. Well, that explains why you're such a good communicator, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 
Yeah, you make it interesting and uh, really comprehensive, detailed, very informative. So what do we have here in this photo? Uh, this is just, uh, I think I get to the end of my slideshow, but that's a variety of cabbage that we like for, well, not only its great storage potential, but just because it's such a beautiful looking cabbage. It's a red Savoy cabbage, and it's... Um, it's one of the last to harvest in the in the winter. I think we harvested this cabbage um, just a few days before Christmas this year. So it's a real cold, hardy variety, um, but a beautiful one too. So we're happy to grow it. But mm -hmm. that's uh, the end of my slideshow. Well, tell us a little bit what your plans are for the future. You're going to extend um, the acreage. You've done that by going to Wheaton Farm. Um, have you also extended the offerings? Um, just a little bit. I mean, we, we are trying to master what we're doing right now. Uh, so we've ex expanded our acreage now. This year we'll be tilling about 50 acres of vegetable, which uh, we've come a long way since we started on just five back in 2010. Uh, but it's, it's a lot more of the same. Uh, you know, real focus on uh, tomatoes, onions, carrots, and beets. Uh, we still are trying to master the peaches and the fruit, uh, but we are going to expand production of strawberries. This year we're going to triple the size of our planting and hope to be able to offer some pick your own strawberries in June of 2016. So that's our, mm -hmm. our major goal for this year is to be able to expand organic fruit production and hopefully get the pick your own off the ground for next season. And having a pick your own will... Uh, invite more people to come to the farm, see uh, everything else that you have to offer, and increase your business. Sure, we hope so. I mean, we, we really like to have people on the farm, and so uh, creating other more things for them to do. Besides, right now, it's just a, a limited number of pick-your-own crops. We do the pick-your-own pumpkins, and the CSA gets to pick uh, their own beans and peas throughout the season, and, and cherry tomatoes. But we'd love to have more of those crops and we want to invite the public to the farm in more seasons than just in the fall. So this uh, expansion in strawberry production will hopefully go a long way in accomplishing that goal. One thing I've noticed uh, on your website um, is the newsletter that you send out monthly, I think. It's actually weekly. Weekly. I get it weekly. Okay. You know, well, weekly in the summer, I should say, but you're right now you've, you've been receiving it more on a monthly basis. Mm. And I love the fact that... Um, it, it includes a recipe. You take, you know, one of your vegetables or more than one and combine it in a really interesting uh, recipe. I think that's really, really a, a nice added feature. Yeah, it's, um, you know, we try to focus on the less popular vegetables. Everybody knows what to do with tomatoes and with peppers, but, you know, the less used vegetables, the radishes and the turnips, they're still really good eating but there's just not as many preparations that people are familiar with out there. So we try to focus on those lesser-known crops and uh, try to give some good recipes so that everybody's eating all of the vegetables that we grow. We grow a diverse mix. And well, uh, what's interesting, too, is the... Let's take turnip, for example. You have so many varieties of turnips. Yeah. I never knew there were so many turnips. Some of, some might say too many, but uh, we yeah, we offer a couple of uh, fresh-eating salad turnips, the white hawker eyes and the pink scarlet queens, which are great in the spring. And then in the fall, uh, we get more into some of the storage turnips, like the macomber turnip, which is actually a turnip and a rutabaga cross. Uh, that one's my favorite. It has a good sweetness. And then there's the, the uh, old uh, conventional purple top turnip that people are most familiar with. But, uh, yeah, we, we do have quite a variety of turnips. And the other thing that's interesting is that when you do cite all those varieties on your, in your newsletter, you explain the, the quality and the fragrance and the taste and, and what's special about them and, then, and also the multiple uses for them, not just to boil them and mash them. Right, right. There's, uh, that's, that's probably the uh, most common preparation of turnip is a boiled preparation, and uh, I don't think it does turnip justice turnip deserves more. Do you, do you think a turnip d deserves to be roasted, for example? Yeah, right. I would agree. I would think, you know, a, a roasting at 300 or 350 degrees is able to convert those starches into sugars, mm. and it's going to be a better eating, sweeter turnip. And you'd, you'd sprinkle olive oil? And oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've got to add a little fat, right? A little, <laughs> maybe a little salt, too. But right. Yeah. So tell us, um, 
if you, tell us what you you hope to see in this coming year um you know so that the, the citizens of Easton will uh be be curious to come and and find out what's happening at Langwater Farm okay well like i said we've expanded our production over at Wheaton so if you're driving south in southeast and on bay road you'll see more acreage tilled up over there we have big plans for potatoes and winter squash and Brussels sprouts over there, and even uh, an early tomato planting. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how everything works out over there. We'll be putting some work into the barn there, um, trying to rehab the barn, which is in good shape but needs a little TLC. Um, so watch out for that, some changes on the other side of town. And then over here, uh, we're going to be focusing, like I said, more on some of the perennial fruit crops. Uh, planting more for next year and also we are anticipating a good strawberry crop for this year. It, we don't have a lot of acreage planted, not enough to offer pick your own, but uh, we should be able to keep the retail shelves stocked with mm -hmm. good fresh eating strawberries for the month of June um, and maybe a little bit of May. Now you know um, the the Grange and the Agricultural Commission in town has, has a community garden uh, just opposite your Wheaton Farm uh, field. Yes, we do some of the tilling for the garden there. I thought you did. So you put, you offer some community service as well, which is nice. Yep. Yeah, we yeah. do um, um, annual tilling. We turn it in the spring and then again in the fall. And uh, you know, we invite any of the gardeners that are there to come over and and talk to us while we're working in the fields. There, we're happy to give advice or uh, just trade some stories, some good vegetable growing stories. Great. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. This was a fabulous presentation. Your slides are great, and um, but the reality is even nicer. So we hope that everybody gets a chance to, uh, it's in starting in May, to visit the farm and continue to support uh, this wonderful, wonderful uh, addition to healthy eating and uh, preserving and conserving the environment for which Easton is famous. Great. Well, yeah, thanks for having me, Penny. It's always fun to share the yeah. story. Okay. Thank you. Kevin, that was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you so very much for coming and sharing this wonderful history, this wonderful Langwater Farm, and the crew and staff, uh, uh, and especially your wife who's not here, who I'm sure is your uh, co-conspirator, helping hand, and mastermind of uh, future projections of what you want to do. Uh, we appreciate so much your being here and sharing your story with, with Easton, as well as the Grange. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Penny. We're always happy to come and share our story. Uh, it's fun for us to tell, and we enjoy doing it. Great. Thanks again.